College. This is Thursday, October 28, class session. And we have a problem here because somehow I didn't hit the record button on the recording. So even though you have my notes right here, notes would do a lot better if I added some explanation to it. So a two-hour explanation is not in the cards right now, which I apologize for. But I do want to point out some key things on these notes, as this would be the only audio-visual you have. You can work your way through the notes, but I appreciate you want to have some kind of narration over the key points. Let me give you a quick run through on this. So the topic, we're talking about multiple integrals, polar coordinates, and then eventually triple integrals. And the idea is we want to work in any coordinate system, rectangular, polar, cylindrical, spherical, or even arbitrary coordinate systems. So the first graphic here, I was reminding you how you connect the rectangular, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates. First example is our first polar integral example, where I have a region in the xy plane described as quite literally a quarter circle. But I don't want to integrate involving square roots and powers of square roots. I think that would be awkward. Since the limits are a quarter circle, since the integrand x squared plus y squared has its own circular symmetry, I'd like to move into polar coordinates. It's easy to describe the region in terms of polar coordinates, theta from 0 to pi over 2 and r from 0 to 3. I can even visualize, and this is a very bad drawing, but I can visualize the bowl over this region. On our website, I posted a Mathematica notebook showing you a nice calculation of this bowl. So why do I want to move to polar coordinates? I see the natural circular symmetry in my region and in my integrand. So using x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta, I can switch the x squared plus y squared into r squared. I can switch the dx dy into dr d theta, and the limits for r and theta are easy to describe. But the problem, as we hinted at the end of the last lecture, is I cannot make dA equal to dr d theta because that dA would not be uniformly the same size for different r's. You say that dr d theta, these little red patches, they differ in size based on my distance from the origin. So the short answer is I need a constant of proportionality, and I need to write dA is not dr d theta, but r dr d theta. Now this is a geometrical argument for the purpose of this r. And next week we'll give you a technical argument. But right now you have to write down in your notes that when you switch from rectangular to polar, you replace the dA with r dr d theta, not just dr d theta. Then when you go and execute that integral, it works out very nicely in polar coordinates to 81 over 3. So why should you change coordinates in any multiple integral, single, double, or triple? And I'm looking ahead to the day we'll change coordinates arbitrarily, not just polar, or not just spherical, cylindrical. So the idea is what? We want to change our coordinate system if it makes the limits, the region simpler, if it makes the integrand simpler, or maybe it makes both the region and the integrand simpler as it did in this example above. But remember, there is always a price to pay. And that price will technically describe next week that price is called the Jacobian. In the polar case, that price called the Jacobian is equal to an extra factor of r. 
Now, a double integral and an integrated integral, legally they're two different things. But it turns out that we can write double integrals in terms of iterated integrals because we write dA is dx dy or dy dx. Then we can work our integrals from the inside out. But we have to carefully describe integrals from the outside in and work them from the inside out. And not just as blocks. Maybe the y on the outer limit. The outer limit's always the largest and easiest to set. It's constants most often. But as I work my way in, I have to be more specific about the limits. They might be curves that depend on the variable y or the other variables involved. So we're going to do a simple example here where we take the volume of a tetrahedron and the volume of a tetrahedron with vertices at 3, 2, and 1. The plane that describes the roof of this tetrahedron house is x over 3 plus y over 2 plus z over 1 is 1, or 2x plus 3y plus 6z is 6. So now I'll write a triple integral. I'll describe this tetrahedron with respect to y as 0 to 2. With respect to x, for a given y, the x slides from 0 to this line in the xy plane. That line is x equals 3 times y, 1 minus y over 2. And then the roof of this tetrahedron house z equals 0 to z equals 1 minus y over 2 minus x over 3. And that came from the equation of the plane. Now I slowly and carefully evaluate this. The integrand is 1. And you see the first integration performed just gives me the double integral of the height of that house, 1 minus y over 2 minus x over 3. Very much like the double integral. Triple integral for volume and this double integral over this function are the same because the double integral is the contribution of height to the area, to the floor area of the building. So I just work my way through this, integrating carefully x and then y. I notice I could clean up my y by doing an appropriate factoring. In the first two terms, I'll factor out 3 times 1 minus y over 2. And that allows me to write 3 times 1 minus y over 2 times 1 minus y over 2. I get to combine the 1 minus y over 2 squareds, get 3 halves of that. And with the u substitution, or carefully, you can see that the function that I differentiate to get 3 halves 1 minus y over 2 squared is negative 1 minus y over 2 cubed. Evaluated from 0 to 2, it's going to be a very nice result of 1. And that result of 1 is 1 sixth of 3 times 2 times 1. And in general, tetrahedron volume is always 1 sixth of ABC. If you're talking about the A, B, and C and being the right angle distance from the origin. General tetrahedrons, we'd have to be more descriptive. But tetrahedrons are important three-dimensional volumes because remember a tetrahedron is one-sixth of the volume of a parallel pipette. We pointed this out once that you could take a parallel pipette and cut it into six equal volume tetrahedrons. Not six equal shape tetrahedrons, six equal volume tetrahedrons. do another example from the book 54200 where we do a triple integral but this time a function contributing to that triple integral and they give us limits of x equals minus y fourth to y fourth y zero to two and x zero to four we got to fiddle with that to find what this looks like because x equal y fourth and y x equal minus y fourth those are two fourth degree bowls that are going horizontally left and right. Since I only want z uh, y to go from 0 to 2, I only want the upper half of this shaded region between those two bowls. 
here's a very bad drawing of that, but pretend this triangular curved region lays in the plane and then slides up and down the z-axis. Maybe it's some crazy hotel I'm building. Let's find the contribution of this function to that hotel. <coughs> Not the volume of the hotel, the contribution of the function sine x plus y to that hotel. We set our limits, y from 0 to 2, x from minus y fourth to y fourth, as shown in the upper right hand figure. And then z, the hotel just slides up and down four floors. We slowly evaluate with respect to z, inserting z equals 0 to 4. Evaluate with respect to x. And inserting x equals minus y fourth to positive y fourth gives us a really awkward integral cosine of y fourth and then 4y fifth and some other pieces that look like this on the other side. Well, I'd have an impossible time integrating cosine y fourth unless I realized that cosine of y fourth and cosine of minus y fourth, in this case, they combine to equal zero because the cosine of minus one fourth is y to the fourth is the cosine of y to the fourth. So with the little algebra going on right here, this is reduced to the cosine or to the integral from zero to two of eight y to the fifth, which we can work out carefully with the power rule. It'd be two hundred and fifty six over three. This is a good result. What does it represent? Remember, it's not the volume of the hotel, but let's say that I was pricing the volume of the hotel by this function sine x plus y. Maybe every cubic foot of that hotel is priced at a different price. This is sine x plus y might be the price per cubic foot. And then I sum the price per cubic unit over all the cubic units of the hotel, the 256 over 3 maybe represent the price of the whole hotel. That's an interesting interpretation, isn't it? That I price things based on their position inside the hotel. I think that's quite natural. And then I add up the prices of each cubic foot or cubic inch of that hotel to get the 256 over 3. That's a little bit outrageous. I think you think I'm stretching that. But I think office buildings and hotels are priced. Usually by the floor space, by the square foot. And different sections of the buildings are priced at different rates. So maybe I'm not being totally irresponsible there. Anyway, you consider that, and I'm going to cut off this recording. Now, I screwed up the class recording, and I want to give you this quick recording as a little bit of help. But if you have more questions on this, please contact me and I'll give you a little bit more information about what we did. You can follow the examples that are done in the book. Thank you for your patience. I'll talk to you later. Bye.